Hey everybody, my name is Christopher Jones and I'm one of the emergency medicine faculty members over at Nationwide Children's Hospital. Today we're going to be talking about pediatric LGBTQ healthcare, specifically for you as EMS providers. Since many of you will be taking care of patients in this population in your pre-hospital work. So without further ado, let's get things moving. So you might be asking why I'm coming today and kind of chatting with you guys asynchronously here online. And it's mostly because this is a topic that I think uh, both your chief as well as just you guys in general uh, have not had as much exposure to. Uh, and the overall objectives for today are going to be quite a few things. So we're going to hope to recognize some of the, st the statistics about our LGBTQ community, to understand some of the common terminology present in the community, commit to asking unbiased, appropriate social history questions, recognizing the medications that some of the patients that you guys may pick up on runs may be utilizing, particularly in those who might be transitioning as transgendered individuals. Uh, and then we're going to learn some of the regional locations that you guys could not necessarily refer, but offer as guidelines um, or guidances. Uh, we may not get to this at the end, just because I want to make this less than 30 minutes. Uh, that being said, quite a few of these resources in include crisis hotline numbers. So for those of you who may be doing runs where you're picking up patients who may have some mental health concerns, but may not meet uh, need to bring to a hospital right away, could have some great resources. So first and foremost, let's talk a little bit about the statistics that we know as to why we're probably talking about this today. So in general, there's over 9 million LGBTQ people here in the United States, 3.5% of the population. Uh, and that was all based on the 2010 United States Census, which actually showed that 646,000 households were basically headed by same-sex partners, couples, etc., that being said, um, in the 2020 census, they actually removed uh, any questions about sexual orientation and gender identity from the questionnaire per the last administration. So unfortunately, this data is not up to date, but my guess is that it is even higher than it had been previously. So this still you know, begs the question like, why us, why you guys? Uh, a lot of the concerns for the LGBTQ community is there's a lot of healthcare disparity for many of them. So it was up until 1973 that homosexuality was actually considered a disorder in the DSM, which as a reminder to you guys, if you don't know, is the diagnostic tool for psychiatrists. Um, and it wasn't until 2013 where transgendered status was actually switched over to gender dysphoria from gender identity disorder. So for both kind of sets of groups, if you will, I mean, we're really in the last 50, maybe less years, people were still considering this a psychiatric illness. Um, we also know in the setting of the LGBTQ community um, that there's a higher rate of things like HIV, STIs, unhealthy weight, mental health issues, um, I will say for the first point of HIV, there's been some newer studies that have shown with the addition of a medication that some of you may come across called PrEP, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis, which we'll talk about a little bit later, that number of LGBTQ community members who are actually contracting HIV has decreased. And one of the leading groups now is actually heterosexuals. So just know that a lot has changed in this community uh, based on some of the health care that they have received, but it is not equal for all. Uh, we also know that unfortunately this group uh, is less likely to go to PCP appointments, get mammograms, get pap smears, really do a lot of their appropriate screening tools. So this slide specifically, I think, really delves into the crux of most of the conversations that people have about transgendered care in general, but also understanding the terminology, right? So a lot of these parts we're all we're going to talk about in a lot more depth, but some of the ones that are probably the least debated are things like biological sex. So as you can see, that is because it's measurable, usually with organs, hormones, and chromosomes. So it can range from females being those who have XX chromosomes with the, that, excuse me, with a vagina and ovaries to a male with penis testes and an XY chromosome or XY chromosomes. Uh, and then you're somewhere in between can be intersex. It's intersex is the new, more appropriate terminology for the old outdated, uh, horribly offensive terms such as hermaphrodite where you present with maybe male and female genitalia. 
And again, you can be on some sort of a scale in between that as well. That is kind of a term that I think most people on both sides of pro and anti LGBTQ, particularly transgendered health, um, kind of agree upon. The next one is gender expression. And this has a lot to do with how you demonstrate your gender. So via the infographic, if you look of the gingerbread person, it's kind of that dashed line on the side. It's the whole being and how you're presenting yourself through the ways you act, dress, behave, and your interactions in general. So that could be that you present yourself as a more feminine person versus a masculine person. Um, and then somewhere in between more of an androgyny, which a lot of people think of androgyny, I think as a good example, a lot of models, uh, especially runway models, um, when you look at them, you know, they have a very sleek look, short hair, um, sometimes shaved. They're a female, but they present this more masculine energy. But when you look at them, you're not entirely sure. And that's more androgyny. And that's the beauty of gender expression is you can present who you would like to be. It does not necessarily mean how you identify as yourself. It means how you are choosing to express yourself. These terms become a little bit more antiquated and difficult, um, but it's something that we want to explore so that people understand the crux of the differences here. We're going to talk about identity and sexual orientation on uh, further slides just because they are a little bit more in depth. But my own belief that this gingerbread person, uh, genderbread, excuse me, is a really great infographic to get this uh, kind of easy breezy components out of the way. First and foremost, it is absolutely okay to ask questions. And I would say most people in the community, particularly in our transgender community, are willing to chat with people who are willing to listen. And I think that's the biggest part. Slipping up, saying the wrong pronoun to someone because you didn't know, I promise you, no one is going to be upset with you. Uh, it's more so when they tell you their pronoun is he, him, his, but they're an anatomic female and you continue to call them her. Uh, and they correct you twice, that's when frustrations find themselves. So I think the biggest thing to say is it's okay to ask questions. Um, and that's a normal thing, especially this is a more, this is a developing component of society that none of us are experts in, including those of us who are in the community. Um, so the next conversation piece is gender identity itself. We already spoke to it. It's a person's internal sense of their masculinity or their femininity, but it exists on a, on a spectrum. So some of the examples of the terminology you would use about your own gender identity. So I would imagine, but do not want to be assumptive that most people listening to me here today are cisgender. I myself am cisgender. So what that means is cis is same. It's suggesting that you are the same gender as the one that you were born as. So for me, I was born an anatomic male and I identify as a male. Therefore, I am a cisgendered male. Transgender kind of means a cross um, and that's uh, the gender you identify as usually the opposite of what you were born. So that could be something as simple as you know, you were born an anatomic female, but you identify as a male, uh, go by he, him, his. So you are usually at that point, a transgender male. There's also some other terminologies that may come into your being that you'll hear called non-binary and gender fluid. Non-binary basically means you do not kind of um, subscribe to the idea that there's a male and a female. There's something in between. So binary is saying it's two. So you're saying it's something in between that. And then there's people who are gender fluid and genuinely don't necessarily have the exact same gender identity every single day. Those become a little bit more complicated. Um, however, it is a terminology you will come across. You may also hear some terms that are getting a little bit outdated at this point, M to F or F to M, which is male to female transgender or female to male transitioning type situation. Um, and that is going from your anatomic to your identified transition. Some pretty easy gender identity questions. And for clarity, this for EMS providers, let me be clear, if you have a patient who's obviously unstable, et cetera, these are not conversations you're gonna be having with these patients. You're there to save their life. We all know that, they know that. 
if this is a mental health break or some sort of a conversation where maybe you're able to have these, these are great clues and great conversation pieces to have to keep that conversation comfortable. Um, and asking things like, what's your current gender identity or what sex were you assigned at birth? Or, what are your pronouns? Um, having some sort of identifier on yourself to say that you're kind of someone who understands that conversation is always helpful for them to feel more comfortable. It is not a requirement by any means. Uh, you do not need to go up to someone and immediately say, what's your gender identity? It often is not something that is the first based question. However, if they are just suggesting to you that they are a male um, and they're transgendered, sometimes you do need to know medically what sex they were assigned at birth because that helps you determine what their organs are and knowing, you know, if they're coming in with potentially an ovarian torsion, um, even though they're identifying as a male because they still have their internal female parts. So some of that is probably past the point of view as EMS providers, but as healthcare providers, it is actually very helpful for us to know. Now I want to talk a little bit about the actual act of transitioning. So this happens in a couple processes. So the biggest, biggest one is usually the first one is the social. That's where you're changing your pronouns, changing your name. Usually it happens prepubertal in today's society. So some of our younger generations are Gen Z and whatever's after them at this point. Um, many of them identify at a younger age as, you know, I believe I'm a female, even though, you know, it's your son, Johnny. Um, and that is absolutely okay. But the transitioning period of medical of any sort does not happen until puberty and after. So uh, most young people are going to start that social component now younger. You will find, especially many of you who work in our community, will go out and find a lot of people who unfortunately are in their 50s, 60s, 70s who are transitioning at this age and are still in that social component because back when they wanted to transition or maybe knew of them being different, it was not nearly as accepted. I mean, look, it was still considered a psychiatric illness at that time. So it could change, but I imagine the mass uh, trajectory forward, it will be mostly a prepubertal con conversation. Then when you move into the medical component, and this is the part many of you probably are asking about these medications, most of these are going to be given at or after puberty. So the first one and the only one that's really given to anyone under the age of 18 that would involve any sort of children is the gonadotropin releasing hormone blockers. And basically that pushes off your puberty. So the first signs of puberty, you'll give this medication to delay puberty onset to allow people to have that conversation about whether or not they want to potentially transition down the line. It does not immediately transition. It does not cause you to... Um, you know, develop the opposite sexual organs. It literally just kind of pushes your pubertal beginning back. Um, we do these medications for people who have things like precocious puberty. So they are well studied and have been in play for years and years and years. Well, before all the transgender medicine kind of came about. Then as you get older, you're going to do things like hormone replacements and gender reassignment surgery. So this is usually 18 and older. Um, and teenagers are not actually accepted to be able to do this until they're over the age of 18. So this slide specifically then talks about the medications that are gonna be used for medical transition. For many of you, these are probably the questions you have when you go on a run. Are there medicines that you need to be worried about that people might be on that would keep you from doing other things? And I think the biggest stuff that I want you to see is in the categories on the left, you'll see hormone blockers, Basically, hormones in general, whether that be estrogen or testosterone or anti-androgens like a spironolactone. The biggest thing on all of this, if you look on the third, I guess technically the fourth column, the adverse effects, is there are very, very little side effects of these medicines that should ever affect the way that you're managing a patient on a run. If they are septic, give them fluids and antibiotics. If they're an SVT, give them adenosine. If they are, you know, uh, coding, give them epi. There's, you know, there's really not anything I would say you cannot do because a patient is in a transitional period. The only thing that you may need to know is that classically with any sort of estrogen-based products, including things like oral contraceptives, they're at a higher risk for certain clots, whether that be, you know, PEs or DVTs. Um, so unless you have some sort of a protocol worried about DVTs or PEs on your uh, rig, there's really not much I would say that you can't do for these patients. Um, the only other thing to think about is if they're on spironolactone, let's say they overdose and they're non-responsive, 
if you're concerned they have hyperkalemia from that, that is a possibility as an arrest. But again, that's kind of reaching at this point, to be honest with you. I kept this slide up. So you guys have this if you ever need it. Obviously, they talk about the pathophys of the medicines, their desired effects on their monitoring, which really probably is not what you guys are interested in today. So it's there for reference if you need it, but don't expect you to really necessarily focus on those parts. And then going back a little bit more about the terminology. So the other thing I want to talk about is sexual orientation. So this is uh, the last part of that gender bred person we did not discuss, and that's the person's feelings of sexual attraction. So you can see that that's made up of a lot of stuff, behavior, identity, and desire. The reason I bring up these things is because there's different components of where you could fall on this basically old school Kinsey scale is what they used to call it. You know, you could be a heterosexual person where you're attracted to the opposite gender, a homosexual attracted to the same, bisexual attracted to both. But that complicates things because then what about transgender people? Because if they're gender fluid, then they're not technically a gender or they're non-binary which is kind of why pansexual, which is attraction to all genders, has come a play. And then asexual for people who have really no sexual uh, attraction whatsoever. The reason I bring up this part, and this is the statistic that usually boggles a lot of people's minds, is, you know, 73% of men who admitted to sexual activity with men actually identified as heterosexual. And I think that's a big part of why sexual orientation is not only just about identity, uh, it's also a behavior and a desire. So you could be having sex with men, but you still state that you're a heterosexual male. Um, that is why it is a spectrum. Um, and so much has changed probably in the last many years uh, in that aspect in general. Other big things, just as an FYI to you guys, as far as documentation of these type things, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare in about 2015 said they're requiring EMRs to have places to check these kind of boxes to help with medical care. Probably unaffected for you all, but sometimes helpful information to provide to the team that you are uh, signing off to or, you know, dropping off a patient to in case you know some of these details and may help with their medical history. Sexual history questions. Truthfully, this is probably out of the realm of what many of you are going to do on a run, um, but some of you may have family, friends, etc., who identify in the community. And I think the big thing is to kind of know when it's appropriate and not appropriate to ask kind of more sexual history questions. If you're picking up a kid, obviously a three or four year old, I don't imagine any of you are ever going to ask anything like that. This, I would be shocked if you did. Um, and it's probably not needed. Um, however, you know, God forbid your, you know, the conversations come up, start with the basics. You know, do you have a boyfriend or girlfriend at school? Has anyone kissed you on the lips? If they're like, ooh, cooties, I got my cootie shot. You know, we probably need to move forward and kind of, you know, make light of the conversation and move down the line. As they get more and more mature, more adolescents, et cetera, which is potentially some more of the date violence conversations that you may be having with some of your um, pickups for some of our mental health crises patients. You can ask things like if they're in a relationship, if they've had sexual intercourse in the last six months and being open about how you're asking what types of partners they're having. Uh, the newest, probably easiest question is just tell me about your sexual partners. Sometimes it's too open and then people start saying, well, I, there's Johnny, he's buff. And it's like, oh, whoa, okay. I meant more like men, women, or both. Um, this is still a, a hard one to tell you what to do because I still feel like uh, people misinterpret the question pretty regularly in general. But long story short, you want to be open-ended just so that you can make sure that you are covering these people for uh, all of their mental health as well as sexual health questions. Obviously, if you're going in depth, which you guys should not necessarily be doing in EMS, uh, quantifying, qualifying, and asking a little bit more about their exposure history is always helpful. Um, probably the biggest thing for you guys is probably more safety, domestic violence type screening questions, I would imagine, if anything, um, dating violence, etc. So then the next part is going to talk a little bit more about why this probably matters even more for us and for you guys as EMS providers. And that has a lot to do with the mental health and healthcare statistics of this community. So the youth specifically is very strongly affected. Um, they're more likely to be bullied online or at school. 84% uh, of those who were uh, surveyed had said that they had been verbally harassed at school with 64% feeling unsafe due to their sexual orientation. 
with only 5% of those students saying that they actually felt that their teachers were supportive of them because of their sexual orientation. 12 to 28 percent had either been threatened or injured with a weapon. Uh, 18 to 29 percent had been victims of dating violence. 14 to 32 percent have been victims of rape. 28 percent have been dropped out, excuse me, or have dropped out of school. As you can see, quite a few high statistics there for some of our adolescent patients. Um, it was a little bit older of a st study, probably in the last five to six years. However, the Trevor Project, which is an incredible organization that helps with the LGBTQ community, particularly those in the uh, youth category, they did a survey uh, last year, which is actually very eye-opening for the mental health of many of these patients. So they noted that 94% of respondents, and it was some 30,000, uh, of their youth state that the po politics right now have actually affected their mental health, which I think does not surprise many people when we look at all the things, bills, conversations, policies that have been going out and about um, in the community in the last year to two. 60 to 70 percent of surveillance have had symptoms of anxiety or major depressive disorder. 48 percent suggest that they wanted to get counseling, but they were unable to get it for some reason or another. 42% of them seriously considered suicide, with more than half of the transgender survey participants saying that they were some of those people. 70% said their mental health was extremely poor during COVID-19, with 30% identifying that they had uh, had issues with food insecurity. 13% of them st stated that at some point before their 18th birthday, they were subjected to conversion therapy, which is horrifying. Um, and the biggest thing that I think was most helpful is in the survey, they noted that the transgender youth who had their pronouns respected or had some sort of affirming care, whether it be a loving individual or um, validation, were half as likely to attempt suicide. And I think that the reason I bring this up is crucial because you guys are our first responders and your initial conversations with these patients are often what triggers them to then potentially get violent uh, with you guys, which involves giving, gosh, you know, Ativan, ketamine, geodon, whatever you guys are going to give before they come to us. And, you know, having these conversations to keep this from happening would be ideal. The next part is, unfortunately, the community does find that there's quite a bit of medical provider discrimination, and that had a lot to do with an American Progress survey that was done in 2017, and they noted that 8% of le lesbian, gay, and bisexual respondents were denied care in the past year, secondary to their sexual orientation, and that almost one in three transgendered patients were denied care, which is really, really horrible if you think about it. You know, whether or not you agree with um, patients being transgender or not, which feel free to email me and we can chat about it, um, to deny someone medical care, which is, in my opinion, a right, not a luxury um, as a provider, you know, it's, it's heart, it's heart, um, heart crushing, soul crushing, really. Greater than 25% or one in four of LGBT individuals had said that they had been verbally abused by their provider because of their orientation. Um, and many of these statistics are why many of them delay or forgo their care. Um, and there's quite a few of them who have not gone and had follow-ups or appropriate mammograms pap smears, et cetera, because of their fear of um, either care or, frankly, deny of access. So this kind of brings in the next part is, you know, adding on to that, there's just true healthcare disparities and discrepancies and discrimination at this point. You know, there's two, you know, they found that LGBTQ uh, members of society are two to three times more likely to be uninsured. In 2016, the Affordable Care Act actually did add a section that prohibited discrimination based on gender identity, which was amazing. And then unfortunately in 2018, the Department of Health and Human Services issued a rule actually allowing insurers and providers to decline service based on religious beliefs, um, which again went back to allowing people to discriminate against uh, you based off of gender identity or sexual orientation. This really adds in the current system of where we are, which is quite devastating. So as you can only imagine, and I know you all have the news or heard on the news or have seen it on the news, there's quite a few hot button, button topics right now, and that's transgender women in sports, uh, the talks of sexual orientation in education, and that could be something as simple as stating that someone has two dads. 
Uh, and then also uh, transgender affirming care has become quite a bit of an issue. Uh, we've seen things as early as, you know, in 2022, right now in April, when I'm giving this lecture, we have over 235 bills that are introduced to uh, the House that are anti-LGBTQ in some facet, most of which are for anti-transgender in one of those facets, usually in the top topics above. To give you some sort of a guidance as to where that was, five, four years ago in 2018, there's 41 total. Um, last year, we had a similar number almost in the entire year. The 230 and 15 had actually gone through, so we are not moving in the right trajectory, unfortunately. Um, Florida right now is just passed that don't say gay bill, which we're not going to get into at this precise moment, but is pretty devastating for transgender um, and LGBTQ citizens really um, in that state. Alabama criminalized gender affirming care and has stated that any single provider who may be giving resources for this could be uh, put in jail. So uh, a lot has happened and even here in Ohio, you know, right now they're trying to introduce bills to keep conversations out of the school system, similar to Don't Say Gay, um, and then obviously talking about uh, some of the transgender sports issues as well. So uh, it hitting close to home as well. And unfortunately, as we've already discussed mental health issues in this community, I can only imagine that in Ohio, if many of these things pass, that will be on the rise for many of you uh, on your pickups. I did mention this very briefly. I just want to say this. This is kind of like an aside. So what is PrEP? So PrEP is a pre-exposure prophylaxis medication. That is different than what you guys are probably thinking like, oh, I got a needle stick and I'm worried that, you know, I was, you know, the patient had hepatitis or HIV or something. So they give you that post-exposure uh, pack basically for a month after. This is different. So this is for patients who are identified as high risk as potentially developing HIV. Uh, and they take a medication that's currently daily. There's two medicines right now, Truvada and Descovy. They're very similar medicines. Descovy has a decrease in the tenofovir, which is actually the medicine that is affecting kidneys a little bit more. So it's a little bit safer for those patients who have some you know, chronic kidney disease, et cetera. The reason I bring it up is you may see some patients that are on this. Um, it does not mean they actively have HIV if they're on one of these medications. It could be a medicine they're taking to keep them from developing or uh, contracting HIV. So I do think it's important that you know that this medicine may be uh, kind of around. There's not many side effects. One of the biggest ones is really lactic acidosis, which uh, it's very uncommon, so doubtful. You guys will see many side effects of this medicine. Um, or reasons that you may be picking them up, if that makes sense. Studies did suggest, though, when you are um, taking the medication, you are doing a, yourself a service and really decreasing your risk of HIV by like 95%, which is fantastic. Uh, they are currently developing, and I should say have developed and are in kind of the initial phases of like bringing it to the public an injectable uh, version of PrEP as well. So the last part, like I mentioned, I was going to keep this under 30 minutes, so we've got about two minutes left. I wanted to talk very briefly about some of the resources we have in Columbus and in the state of Ohio. So in NCH specific, we do have our Thrive program. Our Thrive program does work specifically for many people undergoing either intersex uh, development or those patients who are undergoing maybe gender affirming care or they need uh, transgender health. And that has a kind of multidisciplinary clinic involving our adolescent endocrine, gyne and neurology services and behavioral health. As far as Columbus themselves are concerned, if you're ever uh, wanting to give resources to people who might be in the community, these are churches in each uh, denomination basically who identify themselves as being LGBTQ friendly. There's medical communities that offer quite a few things, um, both medical care, such as Equitas Health. Um, they've got quite a few locations here, as well as in Dayton. Um, Gay Lesbian Medical Association has some providers that you can look up who specifically uh, manage and work with many of these uh, members of society. And then they talk about different HIV testing sites. There's different family support, diversity support um, sites and locations here in Columbus. You're welcome to give out to and some of those people you're going to see on the run. You know, there's a youth support group such as our Kaleidoscopes Youth Center, which is right downtown close to the Old Town East neighborhood and Mosaic. Um, there's also professional support for those people who want to advocate maybe and are upset about what's going on in politics and get in the school systems to kind of fight this uh, 
ban. Um, there's the Gay, Lesbian, and uh, Straight Education Network. Uh, Human Rights Campaign has a component here in Columbus as well to get on board with. There's different Ohio resources such as Equality Ohio, Trans Ohio. There's different youth. I think this is one of our big ones. A big takeaway for you guys is our National Resources Crisis Line. So these are all the crisis lines that you could potentially allow people to reach out to. Some of these are anti-violence. Some of these are transgender lifelines. Trevor Project, the last three are probably more LGBTQ specific. There's also the Lambda Legal, which is basically a legal service that usually has to do with like hate crimes or uh, anti-LGBT um, legislature, et cetera. So these are all wonderful resources as well for our patients here. And then last but not least, there's other resources here in the physician resources that could also be you guys. It's just talking about different things you may want to know about the LGBTQ community, some of the terminology, some learning materials. And then last but not least is quite a few of very specific national organizations that we have. Thank you guys so much. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Um, I'm always available. I realize my email is wrong here, but it's Christopher.Jones at nationwidechildrens.org. Um, email me, uh, call me, whatever you need, but hopefully you found this helpful and I hope you guys have a great rest of your day.